in studio with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. William, welcome back. Thank you very much, Rob. Enjoy it. Badger, Delegate Mike Heights. Good morning, Robert. The senior member of the Friday crew, Mr. Michael Carl. Good morning, everybody. And the man with the best beard in the house, Larry Schultz. Thanks. Great to be here. Pull that mic down just a, a wee bit more in front of your mouth. All right. I was trying to cover my face, but <laughs> I guess that's not going to work. No. And via telephone, Joseph, Joey Torts Ferretti. Good morning, Joseph. Good morning, everybody. Are you in Georgia this morning, Joe? I am. Oh. You know, we, zero. we've been sending Joe on location a lot to uh, get the latest. <laughs> it. it always seems to be in Georgia. Is, is there going to be a TV 10 uh, a per, uh, camera in the courtroom? There could for the be. Trial? We can get Joe <laughs> to bring one great. in there with a the flag, right? I, I, I can certainly agree for the right contract price to deliver <laughs> remote reports. Well, nobody is better to negotiate than an attorney, and you are an attorney, so you can handle it. Uh, gentlemen, it is uh, intro time. A lot has happened in the last week, so there's an awful lot to get to, so let's not waste any more time. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. Erupting like lava that is molten, the indictments flowed from the County Fulton. Named in the cases were 18 allies like Meadows, Giuliani, and a bunch of other guys. But only one name made Larry Schultz heart pump when Fonny Realist read Donald John Trump. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning to you. Top of the day. Sir Lawrence. You're up next, Mr. Hyde. Thank you, sir. You might imagine what name has been worked into your intro. <laughs> With apologies to what Jim Croce once may have written, Mike Hyde's new nickname has left me smitten. We came up with it last week, and it just kind of stuck. So here comes your intro. Wish me luck. You don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't erase a good delegate rant on tape. You don't pull his mask because he's short in stature. And you don't mess around with the badger. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, baby. <laughs> it seems unimpressed. <laughs> <laughs> we missed this guy last week, and we missed him lots. While his classmate, Justin Th Justice Thomas, was taking those Larry Schultz shots. But Mike Carl returns this week with conservative piety, defending his buddy Clarence with regards to impropriety. With those Yale Law degrees, there's some things you should know. Can we agree, Mike, that one of those is reporting gifts from Harlan Crow? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Mike pled the fifth on that one. <laughs> When the Fulton County DA began her list of... Oh, wait a second. Uh, hold on a second there, Joe. To do this one, I need better music. Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> when the Fulton County DA began her list of names of ill repute, I was surprised to see her fold them all into a RICO statute. As she read the full names and mentioned racketeering, I started thinking, is this a mob trial I think I'm hearing? As she rolled out... Rudolph William Louis Giuliani. I thought, no, you didn't just say it that way, did you, Fonny? As she kept reading the names off, I was all but ready for her next to say, Joseph Joey Torts Don Vito for ready. <laughs> <laughs> now, no offense, Bill, but I can't give you that music. <laughs> i got to go back to the regular to the regular. All right, here we go. All right, now to uh, wrap it up. As they say, never let them see you sweat. But try sitting in a 95-degree studio and not getting your shirt wet. They say it's not the heat but the humidity that makes it balmy. Spend two hours indoors with that. You'll smell like a salami. What a greeting for my next panelist to start this week. The AC was broken. The heat filled up. And, man, did this studio reek. I was out Monday at football practice coaching linebackers to blitz. Well, Bill Stubblefield was here without the AC, taking a schwitz. <laughs> well done, Rob. Well, very, you very. Should, we missed you, Rob. We missed you Monday. Especially we missed you. <laughs> and it was yeah, hot. The that, AC. <laughs> that, that last rhyme was very uh, Close. adroitly done. <laughs> hey. Could have stepped in the wrong direction on that one, buddy. I have said this many times. I am a skilled professional. Do not try this at home. A lot of people make that mistake. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that was Monday. The AC was broken. It broke just as I left Friday, apparently. I got a call that said, hey, there's no AC. And then it wasn't fixed in time Monday for the show. And you and Gilstrap sat here and just 
baked. Yeah, and uh, and well, Jim Klein brought an AC in, but he brought it in too late for us. But it was good <laughs> for the rest of the day. It was great. <laughs> Thanks, Jim, but you were tardy. <laughs> That's one of those. People that say, oh, it's your turn to pick up lunch. I was going to buy today. <laughs> <laughs> Our leadoff hitter, Joseph. Joey Torts, ready. You are up. The issue number one. Well, let's start with uh, with Georgia, since it was in the news all week. And I'm sure that uh, everybody on the show this morning has a thought or two about the uh, Georgia filing of the indictment, whether it's uh, pro or con. Uh, your opinions are, are certainly going to be. Uh, I'm interested to hear them this morning because I think uh, this Georgia case has importance beyond just uh, the allegations of criminal conduct and, and the uh, intent of the prosecutor to punish that conduct. Uh, one, you may think that uh, the fact that a bunch of lawyers were included in this indictment is important because uh, it apparently uh, some of these lawyers were behind the scenes manufacturing a lot of this uh, nonsense that was going on about some of the state elections, and they should be held accountable. Uh, there are certain state election officials who were assisting, allegedly, uh, uh, others to gain access to voting data uh, so that they could be examined. Uh, that is an illegal act, and perhaps some of those state election officials should be called on the carpet for that. Maybe you think it's important for states' rights because the states do administer their own elections and to have interference from the White House and from a cadre of uh, other federal actors, perhaps uh, this is a, a, a really a recognition about uh, the importance of the states administering their elections rather than having interference from uh, elsewhere. And, of course, some people think this is important because whatever convictions arise from this case eventually are beyond the presidential pardon power. Uh, or you may be in the other camp and think that this is just another in a long line of indictments that are uh, just piling on at this case, and it's election interference, and you think that uh, uh, it really does injustice to not only the criminal justice system but to the country as a whole. So I'd be interested in those thoughts. But I think this case is important for this reason. It is apparent now in the other filings as well as this one that certain people in this country, and I will say almost to a person they were Republicans, took a principled stance and said that they were not going to be party to illegal conduct. And I'm talking about the Georgia Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, the Georgia Governor, Brian Kemp. I'm talking about the head of state elections here in Georgia, Gabriel Sterling. These folks from the beginning, after three recounts in the state of Georgia, said, there is no fraud. Get out of our state. They took that stance. They continue to take it today. And uh, I think that principled stance is important. It's important to honor those people for doing the right thing, for not agreeing to be a part of this criminal conduct that's been alleged, and for saying that it, in Arizona as well with Rusty Bowers, who was president of the Senate, for those election officials in Michigan who stood up and said that nothing happened here that would have changed the course of the election, those folks need to be respected and supported. And I think these criminal cases do exactly that. They put a, a seal of, of approval on their principled stance to stand up to the to blistering pressure from the White House and others to somehow call this election into question, throw us into chaos, and, and God knows where we would have ended up. Uh, and I think that's why some of these criminal cases are important, because we had people stand up for what was right. And just like the whistleblowers at the IRS, and in the Justice Department, who are attempting to blow the whistle on what they feel happened with Hunter Biden, all those people deserve respect for coming forward, putting themselves on the line, suffering the slings and arrows, and doing what's right in this country. And that's why I think this Georgia case is important. I'm interested in other thoughts. 
Let's begin with the Admiral, Bill Stebblefield. Yeah, Joe, you're, you've summarized it very well. I, I, when our founded fathers put together the Constitution and the framework for the country, I'm not sure they really anticipated what we're experiencing today. Uh, there's enough emerging not only from Georgia but from uh, the Washington, D.C. and in Florida that will – be spend probably months, if not years, in front of the Supreme Court trying to ra- hash out what can, what was appropriate, and what was not appropriate. It is truly a trying time in our country today. Uh, another aspect of what you uh, you mentioned, uh, Joe, and we discussed a little bit the other day, is something that's not been done on this level but it's been done on uh, in other cases, is what is known as a removal statute that would allow the, uh, uh, the defense, uh, Mark Meadows has proposed this, Donald Trump may well propose it, moving it out of state court to federal court where there would probably be a more uh, sympathetic jury pool than uh, in for for the uh, defendants than what we have with the state court. Uh, that's something that will be kind of interesting to play out as well. Uh, as, uh, as Bill Powell told me later, it is doable, but it's very narrow in how you can achieve this. So if you're a scholar, uh, uh, constitutional scholar or political scholar, whatever the case may be, you're sit back and saying, there is so much material here. We're breaking new grounds every day. So it's it's going to be very interesting to see what how it evolves. All right, he sits to the right of Bill Stubblefield, both in order of our seating yeah. chart and politically. <laughs> Mike Carl. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I I do appreciate the uh, recognition of the you know the partisan uh, color of the of the uh, people who are leading leading the pushback in in Georgia. Uh, the only uh, uh, the only thing that that I'm concerned about is is that the, the timing. I think I think they're they've uh, uh, waited because they did the right thing at the at the time you know, when the election was just finishing up. That's when they did the right thing, and so uh, the 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 uh, surprising and disappointing delay in their proceeding uh, with this kind of a case. Uh, uh, it is a problem, and it and it, it it really just ties in to the political theme of the of the uh, January sixth case uh, in in D.C. the federal case, and and you know so I I I, I think there are many aspects to it, but I do appreciate your, your recognition of the of the party affiliation of the people who who stopped Trump from stealing the election in Georgia at the time of the election. Mr. Schultz. Yes. Um, one important uh, aspect of this is that the <clears throat> witnesses, by and large, in every one of these indictments will all be Republicans. There's almost no Democrats except uh, maybe a council table. <laughs> There's not going to be – this wasn't something that – a lot of Democratic operatives are going to be able to testify because, like us, all they've done is hear about it. The people who did this and the people who will testify and the people who didn't cooperate and said, no, don't do this, and they did it anyway, they will be the witnesses, and all of them are Republicans. So, you know, you can't say that this is a one-sided political uh, attack when the very evidence, which will or will not, convict Donald Trump will come from the mouths of his former allies. Um, I'd also say this. I view this as similar in some ways, (laughs) in a broad sense, to the attack on, uh, on Pearl Harbor. We've got a giant problem with our national survival today. The way you approach it is different. I mean, uh, when they attack Pearl Harbor, you launch uh, our military might against Japan. That's what we did then, and that was what we should have done. When there's an attack on our Constitution, then we have to um, load up in a different way uh, to counterattack. And that's going on now. 
I wish it had started sooner. I wish it had started when Bill Barr was still um, Attorney General, but that wasn't in the cards. And it does take a while, to be fair. You know, they're, they're complaining now about this tremendous stack of documents that they're being expected to review, and they need more time. Um, gathering those documents all into one place is not something you do overnight either. So it took a while to, to do that. Jack Smith's only been on the job about eight months. So that's a pretty quick turnaround, uh, it seems to me. Um, they could have um, gone faster, perhaps, but then the argument would be, oh, you're ramming this through. You know, you're, you're, you're rushing it to a finish. I, I believe we are where we are, and I believe we, um, uh, we, we need to watch very carefully what happens over the next six, eight months. Mr. Height. So I'm going to borrow a line and paraphrase from uh, a movie called A Few Good Men. That The facts don't matter. It's only what you can prove in court. And it seems to me with all of these indictments and, and in all of these cases, um, it seems to me like the, the prosecutors have just thrown everything at the wall to see what's going to stick. And there's a whole lot of, of allegations in, in, in these indictments that – just aren't going to stick to the wall. And I, I, I think they're just trying to get something, if anything, against Donald Trump. And that's the way a lot of his supporters look at this. This is just an attempt to bring him down. Is he guilty? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I don't like him. I can tell you that. I don't like him because of the way he acts and a lot of the things he's done. But has what he's done criminal? And I, that's what these, these cases are going to determine. But you have to be able to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt that he actually committed these crimes. And I think they're going to have a difficult time doing it. Now, you say they're going to bring Republican uh, individuals um, that are going to testify against him. Maybe. But you also have to speak to their credibility. Why are they coming against him at this point? So I, I think there's this is going to be long and drawn out. And it's going to be a muddy mess. Um, and I think the American people are, are disgusted with our presidential politics right now on both sides. I think there are Republicans that say there some Republicans are saying, fine, let's let's have these trials. Let's find out if he's guilty. If he is, let's get him the hell out of there. We're tired of him anyway. But the Republicans are also saying I just wish you would do the same thing on the other side of the aisle because there is some improprieties when it comes to Biden and the Biden family, and it seems like they're overlooked all the time. And and the way I look at presidential politics right now is it's a mess on both sides. Both of these individuals should be facing indictments and and should be having trials right now. And the fact that they're going after Trump and ignoring Biden is what a lot of Republicans have an issue with. Back to you, Joe. Well, I, as usual, Mike Hype brings up some interesting points. Uh, and I'm going to try to address them here. Uh, one is that, that uh, of course, he, he references Biden and, and the issues with uh, the family there. And, and I, I, I was, you know, clear, try to be clear to point out this morning that yeah, there are people coming forward in that case. Again, the, those whistleblowers, or that's what we refer to them as whistleblowers, and the IRS and the Department of Justice coming forward and saying, hey, the, this investigation was not conducted fairly. And, and those people deserve respect. And, and I'm, I'm willing to listen to hear what they have to say. And if they are proven to be right, then I think we follow those leads where it, it takes us with regard to the Biden. Uh, with regard to the point about, uh, you know, we got to vet these Republicans coming forward and their credibility. Uh, let's understand that these folks are coming forward at great peril, both for their political life and their real life. Uh, just look at the abuse and threats that the judge in D.C. is now receiving, having just been chosen to sit on. Uh, the Washington, D.C. indictment against Trump. Look at the abuse that the grand jurors in Georgia, whose names were publicized 
by law, nothing wrong with that. that. That's following the law in Georgia. But now they are being threatened online by these crazies who, who feel it's their job to answer things happening in their court system with threats of violence. These folks are coming forward at great peril, yet they're choosing to do so because in their mind they think it's the right thing. My point this morning is that needs to be respected. Rusty Bowers, who was the president of the Senate in Arizona, a longtime Republican, lost his seat in a reelection campaign because of his stance about the Arizona election not being stolen. And I'll close with this. His quote that he claims to have given the president of the United States directly sums it up. He said to Donald Trump, sir, I supported you. I worked for you. I voted for you two times, but I will not break the law for you. That, to me, sums it up, and that's why I think these, these kinds of people who are willing to take these principled stance, stances in the, in the face of what has to be uh, abhorrent abuse, uh, I think, deserves to be respected. And, uh, and I think it's some of the best evidence you're going to have in these cases to prove these cases in a court of law, that these folks come forward inclined to tell the truth, Again, again, at great risk to themselves. Uh, that is the credibility, and I think we're going to see that as these cases develop. Bill? Yeah. Um, at all, so much of it, again, we, we're facing an individual, whether you agree with him or not, uh, Donald Trump, that has phenomenal charisma. Charisma. Thank you. Uh, and uh, and he, has a, he has influence on over such a large block of people like I've never seen in my lifetime politically. Uh, and uh, we, I think we've gotten everything secondary uh, to, um, uh, to the personalities. Uh, it's, it's so not critical or not trying to uh, elevate him, just his, his hold over a large block of people is nothing short of phenomenal. I think he he sort of represents the anti-establishment movement, and I think people are fed up with the establishment, and he that's what he's always run against. I, I'm I'm not that normal person in politics, um, right or wrong. That's what people are attracted to. I don't know that it's really charisma. I think he's a a hole myself. Um, but you but did vote for him. I, I did vote for him, but it had strictly to do with policies. It had nothing to do with the man who I. I'm disgusted by it. But I think it's because he's anti-establishment. People are fed up with the Democratic establishment and the Republican establishment at in Washington, D.C. And he represented something different, and I think that's where he got his following. As long as we have the two-party system, Mike, we're going to have that. We have, we've got to break, we've got to have a another way to... Uh, uh, to make our voices known, and the two-party system just uh, maintains status quo. I, I don't disagree, but he, I think he represented something outside of the establishment. And, and just because he had chosen Republican, it, I think he, he gained that following because it was outside. It wasn't another Bush. It wasn't, you know, another Clinton. It was somebody outside. He was a businessman. He didn't like politics. He, you know. And, and that's where he got his following. I, and I think people are still fed up with the establishment. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. But he's not the first individual who tried to go populist movement. George Wallace did. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's others. Teddy Roosevelt years ago. Uh, but uh, subsequent to Teddy Roosevelt, no one's been able to get the following that he has, even though they, they follow the populist movement, uh, which is by definition is anti-establishment. Mm -hmm. I think it was built over years, though. I don't think you can say that it was when he came down the escalator that, that built the movement. I don't agree with that at all. I think that he was just the person that was the right person at the right time for the movement, which I think started when Robert Bork got borked. Yeah. Right? Well, when, when he got borked and knocked out, and we hadn't seen something like that before, it angered conservatives, and they were looking for somebody who was going to fight back. But instead, they got establishment republican party conservatives who were passive about it and moved on to the next thing and over the years 
as conservatives looked at the Democratic Party and perceived it as a party that could get away with anything it wanted in the media, including shielding its leaders from examination and conviction, that anger and that frustration built further and further. It built at members of their own party in, this, in their establishment who were not fighting back loudly and aggressively and peaked when Donald Trump came down the escalator and gave voice to those people. And this is what you're seeing now, where ultimately it doesn't matter to a lot of people if Donald Trump is guilty or not. What matters is it's perceived in their minds that the Democrats got away with this for years and still do. And nobody says anything. And now finally a Republican does something and you're all going to jump on him. Well, you've been getting away with it for 40 years and nobody said anything. Why should we back down now? And that's the anger of the movement right there. You know, we have something we've been missing for many months, a Rob rant. That was well, not really. <laughs> well done, Rob. That was well not done. really a rant. <laughs> well, it was close. It was good. And I agree with you. And I agree with what Mike, uh, Mike Hyde said. But. I'll say both what you and Mike said to reinforce my point that there is a lot of charisma with this individual. I agree with you. And he was able to pull so he was able to pull these movements together that someone without charisma uh, would not have been able to do it. Right. And we've had m- m- the individuals made a lot of influence, and I'm I'm going to be crucified for this. Uh, but Adolf Hitler was another one with charisma. Now, I'm not equating Donald Trump with Adolf Hitler. That's the last thing I'm trying to do. But both of them possess the individual to get people excited about their themselves, excited about the movement, ex- excited about the words they're using. We break now at uh, 9 o'clock, 9.02 where you can also get your free radon test kit. The uh, telephone, Joe Joey Torts Ferretti, is with us on the Friday uh, crew. Good morning again, Joe. Good morning. And around the table, Michael Height. Good morning, Ray. Michael Carl. Good morning. Bill Stubblefield. Good morning. And Larry Schultz. <laughs> Good to be here. We all ride into issue number two with the Admiral. Well, uh, the last 30 minutes we had an enriched discussion. It was even more enriched off air with some of the, with some of the politeness thrown aside. When, when, you know, much, when you throw a Hitler out there, it, it gets, gets reaction. More direct. And I want, and even Mike Hornby came in and let his note be known. Yeah. And and I want to make my point again, which I thought I was clear. I was not comparing the two, except the force of the personalities and charisma. That was it. Uh, I'm going to take a change of a uh, change of tone and get away from the indictments and Donald Trump. And that's what would normally be getting a lot of press if we did not have the indictments uh, looking at us. And that was the action on the Hill. Uh, Kevin McCarthy has been dealt a pretty tough hand. He has a very small majority. Uh, One of the things he's been uh, said frequently, he has to win the blue states or the purple states uh, uh, at the next election to keep the uh, keep the House and the uh, Demo- uh, in re- uh, Republican hands, but yet, due to pressure from uh, from his far right, he's having to propose various things to be voted on, such as uh, the um, uh, farm bill. Uh, there, some of the folks want to cut the farm bill. That's cut into the to the gut of a lot of the. Uh, 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 representatives from the farm states. Also, with the uh, Department of Defense uh, appropriation, there's a move to put uh, amendments in that would be more cultural issues than than nor- what's normally in the budget. Uh, there's a move to expunge uh, Trump's impeachment. There's a move to uh, at least some talk about impeaching Biden. All of these play well to his base, but what it does is to require these these representatives that were elected in states that generally go uh, that went to Biden uh, last time. They were an outlier. They won, whereas Biden won. Uh, what's it going to do to enhance his ability to win <coughs> the purple states? All right, let's go to Mike Hyde first. Well, I would I would agree with your assessment, um, Bill. That, that I don't think Kevin McCarthy has been a very good um, leader. He's he's not a very good strategist at all, and I don't think he's looking at at this from a strategic point of view. You don't in an upcoming election you don't put your your purple state representatives in peril when they're they're running for a next election. If if you have the votes 
to get something through without them voting for it, then maybe you, you do push it through. But that's not the case in this situation. And he could have picked a whole lot less uh, controversial legislation to try to push through than what he has been. And, um, you know, it, it seems to me that he is more interested in, in holding on to his seat as Speaker um, than he is about, you know, trying to, to keep the House um, on the Republican side, which means he would lose his position as Speaker. Um, but it, this seems like to me like a power play in, in, in his in his opinion, and I just don't agree with it. It's just bad strategy, and, and he doesn't seem like a very strong leader at all. Larry Schultz? Um, Kevin McCarthy has impressed me for quite some time now as the poor man's um, Lindsey Graham. He will rant and rave uh, right when the news about something Trump has done or caused uh, comes out. And then the next thing you know, he's down in Mar-a-Lago playing golf with the guy and shaking hands with him. Uh, look, he, he's got to decide whether his uh, speakership will survive um, as Donald Trump uh, flies the Republican flag in this next election. If Donald Trump is the nominee, then Kevin needs to figure out a way to hold on to his speakership and helping Donald Trump at every and making excuses for Donald Trump at every stage is not going to be the way. And so he's going to have to pick a time, and I, I just don't think he's capable of it. He's not capable, like Lindsey Graham is not, of standing up there with his spine straight and looking at Mr. Trump and saying, sorry, you've gone too far for me. And we're not going to do this. Uh, look, I don't think, I mean, West Virginia is an overwhelming Donald Trump state. If he's the nominee, the, the, the vote will be very similar to what it was last time. But there aren't that many states anymore that are like West Virginia in terms of that voter split. And it's going to be a much tougher time this time. They thought they had um, a wave coming their way, and it turned out to... Uh, barely ripple the water and they moved it a little bit but not very much and I'm afraid they're headed for the same thing again and it's it's difficult to say whether that's because of Kevin McCarthy's poor leadership or because of him being overwhelmed by Donald Trump I don't know which that'll be but one of those two things is going to mean he won't be the speaker anymore Joe well I, I think uh, generally speaking, Kevin McCarthy is a, is a weak speaker. I mean, we can start with the fact that it took him, what, 15 votes to get the speakership, uh, and he had to cut all kind of deals behind the scenes to get that position. So now the, the birds are coming home to roost, uh, and he has to deal with those folks, and he has to follow, to some degree, some of those deals he cut. The, the, the problem here, and, and we saw this with the last two Republican speakers, uh, John Boehner and Paul Ryan, who, who both got out of Dodge, uh, you can't control uh, part of that caucus, and it's because of gerrymandering. Now, these folks can take extreme policy positions, and they're rewarded for it. And you can't – they have no vulnerability at home to the electorate. They're guaranteed to win that seat. So they can come to Washington and act like idiots and, and, and be rewarded for it. And this is true on the Democratic side, too. Uh, and that's how you get the extremes of, of both parties seemingly driving the bus when they shouldn't be. Uh, so, I, look, I think that uh, uh, McCarthy's in a tough spot here, to, to Bill's point. Uh, he is not going to be in a position to help those Republicans who won seats in 2022 in Biden districts. Uh, he's not going to help those folks. He's not going to be able to because those folks are not controlling the narrative in Congress. And so he knows that some of those folks are going to be vulnerable this upcoming election. Uh, because they did win in Biden districts, uh, not in numbers that, you know, there, there was no red wave, but they did win enough to, to take control of the House. But whether or not McCarthy is going to be able to craft any kind of policy positions or legislation that's going to help those folks, those vulnerable Republicans in those Biden districts, remains to be seen. And I think he's going to have a terrible time doing it. Michael. Well, <clears throat> I strongly disagree with the tenor of this whole conversation. I think McCarthy's done a 
excellent job in the face of against what he's up against. The 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 sharp divisions within his own caucus. I mean, obviously, you know, getting elected uh, uh, speaker was you know the first, the first big challenge, but he he did it, and and I think he's managed it quite well. And one of the things that nobody's talking about is that <clears throat> he's initiating things, you know, that 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 matter should matter to all Americans, but particularly to the people who were, you know, the constituency we're talking about, and that is going after Biden's corruption. And and I th- I th- I think that that he's playing that very well. He he managed to to get Biden to you know make a deal on 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 the budget now now they're facing another you know another crisis and 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 I'll bet he pulls it off and I think he's done a good job given what he's up against back to you bill yeah i think that uh what and and Mike, I agree with you that he is uh, he's pushing certain agendas, but the agendas he's pushing is forcing some representatives in purple states or that's highly vulnerable to make to vote that's going to come back and be used against them at the next election. Mike, when you said Biden, did you mean Robert Peters, Robin Ware, or J.R.B. Ware? I don't even know who you're talking about. You don't, you're not, the Comey re, uh, letter, you didn't catch that yet? The pseudonyms Biden's used in the past? <laughs> oh, oh, you oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. I mean, and, and the, 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 well, that's, there's a lot to discuss. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it'd, it'd take a long time to discuss all Biden's corruption. Well, you are the anchor leg. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, real quick, you know, when it comes to McCarthy, one of the other things you have to look at, and I see it in the state legislature as well, um, it, it, where Roger Hanshaw is the speaker. If, if not Roger Hanshaw, then who? And, and you see that at, at the federal level, too. If not Kevin McCarthy, who? And you, then you, you start looking around and scratching your head and thinking, oh, my God, who? You know, what, what do we have to choose from? Yeah. And, and a lot of times that's how you end up becoming speaker. Yeah, another point is that uh, Nancy Pelosi is like throwing gasoline on embers uh, uh, in a lot of places, but she rarely put something to a floor vote that she did not know that she had the votes. Yeah. My question on McCarthy is, is who is he? What does he believe in? Because I don't really know. I, I know he likes to be the speaker, but I don't really... I knew who Newt, I knew who Newt Gingrich was, for instance. I knew what he believed in. I don't know what McCarthy believes in, other than staying speaker. Yeah, I I think he believes in the you know the free enterprise system, a strong national defense, and and um, um, the great America. That's what I think he believes in. And and he he also has enough experience to appreciate how what what a challenge it is to you know to get the policies pursued you know supported and pursued uh, to achieve those goals some of those republicans interested in a strong national defense might want to place a call to senator tuberville um. <laughs> which which leads us to larry schultz and <laughs> issue number four soon but right now we go to issue number three and that's mike heights all right i'm gonna take it off of uh you know, national politics a little bit um Recently, a Native American group has called on the Washington football team, the Commanders, to change their name back to the Redskins. So my question is, <laughs> did, did, did we get this one wrong in disrespect of Native Americans again? That's the question. Did we get it wrong? All right, let's start first with Larry Schultz. I, I frankly do not have a clue. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to admit that I don't, ha- I don't know any uh, Native American folks, uh, you know, personally on a friend, uh, friendly basis, and I've had never had a chance to ask them what they think. It seemed like the term redskin uh, was kind of a derogatory term, and that always seemed true to me. Um, uh, you know. We generally don't like the idea of identifying people first and foremost by their skin color. And so that, you know, naturally seemed like a smart thing to do uh, to finally stop that. I know they didn't change the name of the Atlanta Braves uh, because, you know, who's who finds the word brave to be uh, an insult? 
Um, you know, if you're brave, you're brave. Uh, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not clear about this at all. Is it a? Is it a prank? Is it a joke? I don't even know the big um, organization that's doing this. Um, it would be interesting to watch. It's going to be fun. Well, the group is the the Native American Guardians Association, who's who's brought this forth. Um, and in the research I looked at, they have said that the term redskin was brought about by Native Americans. That was the term they used to describe themselves. They said redskins, they said blackskins, they said whiteskins, and it was all to differentiate between the different nationalities and, and cultures. Well, and the, the truth is, which has long been ignored by the, the woke, <laughs> is, is that George Preston Marshall started this pro football franchise in the in the Boston area and it was out of respect it was with nobody questioned at that time that it was out of respect and 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 they moved you know the, the franchise moved to Washington uh, and but you know the the respect that was latent in that name was never changed until the woke decided oh well you know let's let's do something different Unless, you know, it must be racist, you know. That, 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 that's just from ignorance, period. I take it there are probably some Native American groups that have the opposite opinion about this. Well, I'm sure there are Native well, Americans. Clearly there were. Because they're, that's what they brought, obviously. Um, I'm not prepared to call them uh, out for uh, some terrible mistake until I see more about what actual Native American folks think. Um, it is a little surprising that um, they use skin tone as a way of referring to other folks, and I want to see more of that story. That'll be interesting to follow. Um, but we'll see. I, I don't. I don't necessarily think that the understanding of the Native American Guardians group is a uh, across the board understanding of Native American peoples. Um, I'd, I'd like to know more about their history, what else they've done, for example, uh, in, um, you know, helping Native American peoples. Well, if you're a former enlisted man or even a current enlisted man, the word commander is insulting. <laughs> it is to Mr. Tuberville, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Ferretti. <laughs> well, I, I have to thought the Indian nations had, had risen up and, and – ask for the change of the name just due to the level of play in Washington. But <laughs> uh, things are looking up now. <laughs> Snyder's gone. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and by the way, Rob, uh, you know, yeah, the Atlanta Braves have kept their name, but they did get rid of that character, Chief Nakahoma, which was a, a uh, yep. bad yes. caricature of an Indian. It was not very flattering. And I'm, I'm glad they got rid of him uh, as a mascot. But, um, it was a creative I, name, yeah, though. I, you have to give him that. Yeah, it was. Uh, but I, I think that, um, you know, the, the term Redskins, I, I kind of agree with Larry on this one. Uh, in this day and age, maybe some would see that as somewhat derogatory because it's a, a you know, skin color is an immutable characteristic, and we try to shy away from uh, labeling people uh, due to those kind of characteristics. But I, I, I think in many respects, this problem can be solved pretty simply. And, and I'd cite to you the example of the Florida State Seminoles. Uh, the university went to the Seminole tribe that, that still exists in uh, parts of Florida, and they got them to sign off on it, saying, hey, it's, it's cool, we like it, you know, honor us, uh, you know, don't do anything uh, stupid with mascots and things like that, and you can still have your guy come out on the horse and throw the spear down at 50-yard line before every game, and it's cool. Uh, I, in some respects, that's a good way to handle it. You just get some of these groups to sign off on it. I don't know that enough groups would sign off on the name Redskins, so I, I doubt very seriously if, if there's ever going to be a reversion back to that nickname. The, the, uh, 
I, I lost my thought. Go ahead. I'll get. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Dylan uh, just text me, but I'll go ahead. Yeah, yeah, would you be kind enough to put me in front of Joe Ferretti in the future because he steals <laughs> all my points. I had a whole list of things, but Joe, Joe methodically covered every one of them. If we think it's bad in Washington with the Redskins, can you imagine those poor folks or the Commanders with those poor folks in Cleveland that's going from the the uh, Cleveland Indians to the Guardians in baseball? Mm -hmm. yeah. What a, what a name that does arouse anything. I think. The key to accepting the name, any name, is to play better on the field. If the commanders slash Redskins start having a winning season, people will embrace it. If they if they keep playing like they have for the last several years, it's going to be a point of irritant. Uh, Dylan texted me, uh, producer Dylan Bishop, a February 2020 survey, scientific survey of 1,000 Native Americans from UC Berkeley had a 50-50 split on whether they were offended. By the Redskins name. That's an interesting result because leading up to the name change, you were led to believe that this was like 95 to 5, uh, overwhelming um, offense for the name Washington Redskins. There was no news of any kind of 50-50 split uh, that I had heard before uh, the name change took place, which... Uh, that's a fascinating result there with the scientific survey. And the point that I lost but I got back now with Joe was the NCAA had cracked down on uh, a mascot names regarding Native Americans. And it was up to the school to find some support or else they had to change the name. As Joe said, the Seminoles got the name changed uh, or kept the name because of that and a lot of other – uh, colleges that use the name just changed it. Stanford used to be the Indian. A long time ago, they changed it to the Cardinal, and I, I don't know if like the Audubon Society has objected to that, and they've then <laughs> gone away from that. Or, I don't know. I heard something about another uh, that maybe they were dropping that. I don't know. Uh, Certain chapters have. Yeah. Certain, yeah. So I, it, I I don't know if they're still the Cardinal or not. They may have mm. they may have dropped that name even. So, but that's California. Well, they're on a kind of a different plane. Even the term Indian is is a uh, slur well but <laughs> i mean who, even the I term mean, indian is not me, what you it seems to me that it's that it's middle-aged white people that dis her, decides what is acceptable and what is not acceptable to to these these groups if you if you talk to a lot of native americans they don't have a problem with the word indian they do have a problem with indigenous people so, you know, when you talk to these groups, a lot of times it's, it's the white people that are offended on their behalf. Well, uh, white people, shut up. Well, I know. In, probably good advice in a lot of places. <laughs> I, know in, I was going to say, Mike, you're opening the door for a whole range of discussion. Uh, I know in um, Canada, for example, they don't refer to them as Native uh, Canadians. They don't refer to them as uh, indigenous peoples. They refer to them as first Canadians. Because they were there before the rest of us showed up. So we should call them First and Americans. First Americans. That'd be awesome. Were they though? I mean, who? What, hey, nobody they, else. Nobody they, else was here before them. But on the North American continent, there, there weren't like Cro-Magnon men or anything like that. Well, we know. Well, don't. yeah, but they were. But if they, they formed up tribes and became what we know. I mean, they're, well, they're but, the, but they weren't. I don't think there were any other, you know, significant racial groups on this continent. Uh, before that, for for these, these groups. Well, if you believe in evolution, then you know we're we're offending the first single cell and, and, amoeba. That and I'd be one hundred percent in favor of calling the, the NFL team in Washington the uh, Washington First Americans. Washington First Americans. <laughs> that sounds like a bank. That sounds like a bank pot to taste. Well, it could be hey. an advertising angle. All Let's right, Larry Schultz, you're on the clock. And uh, that's the Redskins theme song, which was uh, actually, I believe, written by a Native American, if I remember the, the history behind that, right, Mike? Fight for old D.C. Yeah. Issue number four goes to Larry Schultz. Lawrence, you're on the clock. And they went to this 43-year-old woman in Texas who left a voicemail on a federal judge's phone threatening to kill her. She said, oh, I didn't mean that. <laughs> and, the lady and the lady used her own phone. Yeah. So easily traced. Oh, yeah. Um. I, you know, in any other setting, I guess the reason to flesh this out a little bit, in any other setting, in Martinsburg, West Virginia, if you were under federal indictment and you started saying even marginally critical things about the judge, there'd be a knock on your door, and the next thing you know, you'd be in a holding cell until the trial. 
And you can't say that, well, he's got First Amendment rights. He does, but anyone who's been indicted, their First Amendment rights are slightly adjusted from the rights of others. They can't, for example, um, name witnesses and start attacking them in the press. And I wonder what, what's going to happen, but if it continues with Mr. Trump, I believe he's going to get jailed. So what's the specific question here again, Larry? Um, do, uh, do others think that he may find himself in jail uh, as a result of uh, sort of this continuing attacking of judges and, and others? All right, let's start with the attorneys, and I'll go via telephone to Joe Peretti first. Yeah, and before I answer Larry's question, I, I just wanted to point out, Rob, before the break, you mentioned about Cro-Magnon humans being here before uh, the, the uh, Indians uh, in this country. And, and I can confirm that. Uh, <laughs> in fact, there's a few who are alive and well and serving in our state legislature. <laughs> uh, uh, no locals. Yeah. Though. <laughs> just just a minority in the legislature. Right? <laughs> they they do caucus, uh, however. Uh, so I, I, I think that um, uh, I'm heartened, Larry, by the fact that the attorneys have apparently prevailed upon our ex-president not to go forward with his press conference on Monday where he has been advertising new and irrefutable evidence of voter fraud in the state of Georgia. Uh, that was fraught with peril for a man who was under indictment in various jurisdictions for the activities in that state. And so uh, I, I think the attorneys are maybe starting to get through to this guy that you have certain vulnerabilities when you're under indictment and Putting threats out that if you come after me, I'm coming after you uh, could easily be interpreted as a threat against the judiciary. And when that's a federal judiciary with broad <laughs> law enforcement powers, uh, you could put yourself in, in real jeopardy. So I'm hopeful that the attorneys are now convincing him that he's got to button up, shut up and uh, just work on his defenses. To these charges rather than trying to conduct all business in public, uh, which is something he's been guilty of for a long time. But maybe he'll sober up now and avoid what I agree with you could be jailable offenses if he continues down this path. Mr. Carl. Well, I, I agree that, that it, he, he, he should not be doing this. And I hope that, it, as, as you say, Joe, that his lawyers are, you know, Get, persuading him to avoid it, but I also think that that the judges, you know, who would make these rulings, can't overlook the unique political implications of all that's going on. And and I mean, clearly, that's all Trump. Trump, you know, hadn't been listened to his lawyers, and that's why he's you know going the wrong way. But but uh, because he's obsessed with you know purely the political, you know, and kind of overlooking the. The, the legal rules and you know that we we depend on but but uh i i i think the judges would uh maybe have second thoughts about sending to jail cuz cuz the the political implication of that would be awesome in terms of you know national you know uh, views and in point of view so mr bill yeah and i think mike carl is exactly right that because of political reasons they will not send him to jail but i think there's other ways they can take into account uh his outburst statement for example keeping the starting date in uh in the dc trial as early january uh and i get the impression that uh, uh judge chutkin is a uh, will is not one to be messed with so she will probably stick by that starting date, and that would be one way to get uh, to get back at Trump. Mike Heights. So I'm going to agree with with Mike Carl, and and I'm going to say no. I don't think he gets uh, put in jail, and the reason I don't is this is this is an unprecedented um, scenario we're in right now, where he's he's an active. Um, uh, candidate for the president of the United States. So I think judges have to look at the the broad picture and say, you know, while normally we may have put somebody like this in jail, um, this has broader ramifications. And 
Donald Trump has always tried to um, try his cases in open public um, before it ever gets into the courtrooms. And I think that's a lot of what he's doing right now. And, and, and Mike, you're right. I think his lawyers are trying to rein him in, saying you have to really be careful here. This is much more serious. Um, but because it's unprecedented and because he's a presidential, an active presidential candidate, I don't think he would be jailed. Um, he, I, there's no risk of, of flight here. So I think the judges will take all of that into consideration and not jail him. Jackie Long posted this uh, once again on she's done this before all these indictments are going to get Trump elected exclamation point I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before I heard this poll most recent poll I don't know who conducted it. I don't recall I was kind of listening passively and when I caught it so Trump right now is that uh, in a head to head with Biden I think is 43 percent in terms of uh, if you would vote for him for president since the indictments since the indictments within the Republican Party Trump has gone up 14 points since the indictments yeah I know you're looking at me that way Mike you're like really? which indictments there's a half a dozen of them since <laughs> since the last round the, the, the last George, one okay. since the Georgia okay, indictments they went down in the early time he went up 14 points which begs the question as Jackie Long is pointing out are these indictments helping to get Donald Trump elected? Because they're certainly helping him within the Republican Party. He's become much more popular as a candidate within the Republican Party since the Georgia indictments. I think it begs the question as to the legitimacy and the accuracy of the polls. Well, but that's what we say about every poll we don't necessarily agree with. I, I, every time I, I say a poll about every with. poll. Well, you know. Because, because they're, they're, they're clearly flawed and... and a lot of people. The, the, same, the same poll, though, that was taken before the indictment a lot showed a different number. A lot of clear thinking people will not respond to poll inquiries. The, 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 the smart, clear thinking, independent people will not respond to polls. Right. And so that, ta that, that makes the, the poll inherently invalid. Among the biased and the dumb, he has gone up 14 points within the Republican Party. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Well, I can buy that. <laughs> now that makes more sense. <laughs> he's, he's become a martyr. I mean, he, he's, and there's the point, he's Mike. He's become a martyr. Yeah. Yeah, you're the only one who picked up on yeah. it. He's become a martyr within the Republican Party. Yes. Again, this was not a survey of Republicans and Democrats. It was a survey of, Repu of, of Republicans, period, end of story. That who was were the willing to respond poll. to the poll. Well, that's the who, who, were, who, were, who were upset and wanted to make their point about Trump. Well, and a lot of people look at this as just a witch hunt, and this is the way they lash back. This is the way they get back at those people who perceive this as a witch hunt. Fine. You're going to go after, I didn't like the guy, but if you're going to go after him like this, I'm going to vote for the guy just to stick it in your eye. And there's the point that Jackie Long is making, Mike, right? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. You, you keep going after him. All you're doing is making him more popular within the Republican Party. And maybe some sympathetic independents who weren't sure, you know, I don't really want to vote for Biden. Just, you know, I'm going to vote for Trump. I mean, that, that, these people are kind of going back and forth, Bill stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mike has been very... Uh, uh, He's questioned polls for years. The polls have done a much improved job since the 2016 election, and they have been able to account statistically for a lot of those individuals that will not respond to a poll. So I put more faith in polls than what Mike Carl does. I looked at them last night. Uh, uh, statistically, uh, Biden and Trump are in dead heat. If you get down to smaller numbers, Biden has a one or two point lead. But it's interesting that they uh, compared Biden with other candidates, uh, such as uh, DeSantis and even uh, 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 the senator from uh, uh, from South Carolina. Uh, what's his name? I'm Tim Scott. Tim, Tim Scott. Scott. Yeah. I was trying to say Cook. I knew that was not mm -hmm. right. Tim Scott. And Biden has a slightly larger lead on both of those than what he does Trump. And so that makes me a little leery. Of course, it's very early in the game, and these are all within the statistically bound uh, 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 level of error. So. But don't you think the polls got it wrong in 2022 and they, they predicted a red wave that, that never came? No, a lot of the polls did not predict that. Uh, the general uh, populace did, but the polls were showing a much closer race. So the polls, I think, did a pretty good job in 2022. It was the is the mantra among the non-pollsters that it's going to be a red wave. Those, those are the ones that kept saying that, not I don't the know. I looked at a lot of polls, the, the real clear politics, all of them had this big red wave that just never showed up. The, one, of the, one of the problems with that is 
nobody can gauge turnout. And so you could poll every single person and count every single potential vote and get, come up with a set of numbers. But if only half those people vote, those numbers are going to be wrong. Sure. If more people vote than they expect, then those numbers can be wrong that way. And, and, and certainly um, in 2022, Democratic turnout made a difference yeah. uh, in a lot of the states where uh, the questions were close. Agreed. Um, and especially so in the Ohio, recent Ohio election, uh, <laughs> on, the, uh, uh, on the constitutional issue, uh, sure. state constitutional issue. Yeah, uh, Jeff Haddock says the numbers had Hillary winning, and they also had Dewey winning. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not always right, but they, they are right quite often. Yeah, but a lot of the polls with the uh, 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 Hillary winning was before the Comey came out the weekend before. And I think that Comey uh, had a lot of influence on the results of that election. I agree. A lot of, a lot of those polls were also conducted by people who were praying to God Trump didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> now, the jury was a different situation altogether. <laughs> this is a true story. So uh, leading up to the uh, Trump election... Uh, in 2016, I had emails from the networks that said, we'll have a correspondence uh, on the scene at party headquarters. Would you like a correspondent to uh, call in uh, during your election coverage? And, of course, I said, yes, absolutely. So they sent someone from the Hillary camp and nobody from the Trump camp. I'm like, well, that's kind of unusual. So the next morning, they had promised another con uh, uh, reporter. And, again, they sent me someone from the Hillary camp who was – the reporter was suicidal that morning, <laughs> and, I, and I got nobody from the Trump camp. So they, they weren't even they weren't even prepared to entertain the idea of a Trump win in the in the uh, national media, and they certainly weren't about to stomach it once it happened. Uh, so uh, anyway, Larry, you get the final point before we go to issue number five. Uh, I just think that we um, it, it's it's a bit of a uh, to say well because he's running for president it's different. We have a system of laws that apply to everybody. There is no exception in that federal statute and in that federal body of law that says, well, all this is true unless you're running for president or unless you want to be secretary of state. Um, it, it, that's not how this works. And if you don't want to face the bail conditions, don't do the crime. Hey, that's the problem. The, real quick, though, in regards to the, the, the federal indictments versus the Georgia, I heard a reporter say, that Trump could theoretically pardon himself from the federal indictments, but he couldn't on the Georgia indictments. That's correct. Is that correct? Yes. And a governor of Georgia can't pardon Trump because unlike in most other states, including ours, I think, there's a pardons board. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, maybe Joe can correct me as a native Georgian. Um, uh, Cro-Magnon man, Larry, Cro-Magnon man. I think it is a split uh, bipartisan board. So they try to take politics out of it in Georgia or make uh, Larry, at least both people be heard. Go ahead, yeah, yeah, Larry, that's, that's, that's correct. And, and the interesting thing about the pardon power in Georgia is that you have to serve your sentence first. You, you basically get pardoned <laughs> in, in, in name only. You still have to do the time. So, wow. Uh, it, 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 and if, if, if we're, what kind of pardon is that? If he ends up doing that kind of time, we're going to be we're putting it on his gravestone, aren't we? Well, well, I mean, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, it, it, it's the pardon power is is really just expungement, which uh, which wipes the record clean of your criminal uh, charges and conviction, but you still have to do the time. So very limited down here. So on yeah. your stone, it says, I told you I was innocent, right, Larry? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Issue number five, Mike Carl. Real quick, a simple question. Should the Republican Party waive the support our nominee requirement to participate in the upcoming debates for Trump? In other words, should they waive it for him? that he doesn't have to say he'll support whoever is the nominee to get him into the debates. All right, Bill Stubblefield. I think that's a stupid requirement, and it's something that's fairly recent. Uh, and they're, they're, the RNC's faced with a dilemma right now. Uh, they are here requiring everybody else to uh, sign that agreement. Trump, up to this point in time, says he'll not sign it. So are they willing to sacrifice that, that agreement just to get Trump to participate? Interesting question. 
Mr. Schultz? Um, That is an interesting question because I sit here thinking, I want him to talk more. (laughs) 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 I mean, there's so many recordings of him going to be played to juries uh, all across the country over the next year. The more he says, perhaps the better off uh, the system of justice will be. Joe, I want him to talk. Joe Peretti. I, I don't think it was ever his intention to uh, to go to that debate. Uh, but, I mean, the man's under indictment. It, you're going to go to a debate and, like Larry said, start talking, uh, especially when there's going to be questions posed about those indictments. So I, I just don't think he was ever going to go. I thought that his uh, decision not to sign the pledge was just a way for him to get into headlines and suck all the air out of the room again. And I'll tell you this, Mike Carl, if the Republicans would dare try to waive that right for him as opposed to the other candidates, what's the message you're sending? That we're going to accommodate this one guy, but we're going to have everybody else signing this pledge? You might as well just give him the nomination now. Uh, I don't think you can do that uh, legitimately and and call yourself a nominating process. That'd be kind of a rigged election, wouldn't it? Yeah, you start waving the rules for one guy, you might as well just anoint him, be the nominee, and get on with it. I'm going to say no, they should not waive it for him. If you are a Republican and you're running on the Republican platform, then signing this means that you are in favor of the platform and the policies of the Republican Party. And if you are not the nominee, that you will still be in in favor of the platform and the policies of the Republican Party, and that's who you will support, whoever the nominee is. It's up to the people in the Republican Party to decide who their nominee is. And if you're running and that's your platform, then you should support anybody that's nominated, including Donald J. Trump. Mike's making a good point, but uh, the platform is not formalized until the convention. So you're asking someone to sign a a statement, your support, not knowing what that platform will be. It's not formalized. Everybody knows what the Republican platform is right now. So you can go on the Republican um, Party website, and there's a platform right there. Now, is it modified once you have a, a nominee? Yeah, to, to tailor. But it's it, these are minor adjustments to the platform, not major adjustments. Every person running on the Republican platform right now should be behind those major policies on the Republican platform. Where that could come into uh, to play if a, if a uh, a social issue, if a cultural issue is embedded in the platform, that would provide more of a problem. It, it would. I mean, and and listen, everybody, not everybody's going to to agree on every single issue. So as long as your your basis is within the Republican platform, the majority of the way you perceive things is in the Republican platform, then you should support whoever the nominee is. Comes back to you, Mike, final point. I couldn't have said that last sentence better. Uh, absolutely, they should require it of all participants, including Trump. And if he, you know, for, as, as was predicted, that he, he'll find an excuse not to, to participate, uh, that would be just another one. But that just says more about against him and the Republican Party needs to stand on its principles, which are clear, as Mike Hyde has just said. Now, this this, this next uh, debate is going to be under the domain of the Republican Party. The subsequent debates, will they also be under the domain of the Republican Party? Will the same requirement hold true for, for later debates? I don't know the answer to that. And, and my point is, I guess, uh, Trump may may skip one debate, may skip the first debate. He cannot afford to skip all the debates. Well, they're party debates, and then they're you know, independent group managing debates, and you don't have to pledge to support the, the, the nominee or you know, whoever comes – Whoever's the nominee of each of the other party, and, and no, no, I'm talking about the party debate. Well, well, there's, there's, going uh, be cer- well there's going to be several of those going down the line. That, I don't, I don't know if that I agree with you that he can't skip these. He's he's sort of running as the incumbent, even though he's not. He's the incumbent, so, so he, it's it's all everybody else that's got to come and defeat him. So does he have to debate? I don't think he does. So you're saying there's a possibility that he'll not participate in any of the debates. 
I, if if they're going to require him to sign this form and he doesn't want to do it, I would say yes. There's a possibility he won't. He will debate it in the public forum. That's like he always does. Why would he debate? Right, right. He's up by forty points over his nearest challenger in the Republican Party. What does he have to gain to show he, up while he's under indictment and say stuff? He can he can listen to the deba- debate at home and then just chastise people by what they've said after the fact. X that night, Twitter, <laughs> will be filled, or I guess he doesn't use it anymore, will be filled with his comments on what other people are saying. And we'll get to, we'll get to learn everybody's nickname. Right? Yeah, that'll be, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that'll be great. Yeah. Everybody's nickname will be exposed that night. Hey, uh, get your final thoughts together. We got those coming up. Everybody gets eight seconds. <coughs> Unless someone goes too long, then Mike Kite gets four seconds or less. That's just how it works out in the math, Mike. What are you going to do? This segment of the show brought to you by Orsini's Home Store, not just an appliance store any longer. Visit them at 360 Hack Wilson Way or online at Orsini's.com. Mommy, where does flavor come from? Well, um, when people love food, they cook it on a Traeger grill. Meat, corn, even pie. <laughs> and then the Traeger does the rest which brings everyone to celebrate this beautiful thing that they've created. Because when you share delicious food with your friends, that's the flavor of life. Shop now and save at Orsini's today. The Classical Christian Academy at Bethel is helping create extraordinary futures. So we've seen improvements in in our boys on the as I said, arithmetic, reading and writing. I worked in the county, I worked in public school, and that's what I knew. Um, And I knew I wanted to be able to give her more, so I would recommend this to anyone. You know, our daughter has thrived here. Um, The the family-like environment is exactly what she needed. The Classical Christian Academy at Bethel in Martinsburg, equipping children to lead lives of significant impact. Do you have someone in a nursing home or are you worried about somebody you love going into a nursing home? The law firm of Daniel Staggers can protect your assets. Call the law firm of Daniel Staggers today at 304-267-3915. The Daniel Staggers law firm does elder care law, estate planning, and special needs trusts for disabled children and family members. Visit the Daniel Staggers law firm for your initial free consultation at 133 East John Street in Martinsburg. The Daniel Staggers law firm, when you need asset protection for you or for a family member. Your business can become an advertiser today on Talk Radio WRNR and TV 10, your home for local news, talk, and sports. With over 17 million views and counting, you won't want to miss out. From Eastern Panhandle Talk every morning to the sports mix at noon and local high school, Shepherd Rams, Mountaineers, Commanders, Steelers, Nationals, Wizards, or Capital Games each evening, Talk Radio WRNR has it all, all day long. So advertise with us, Talk Radio WRNR and TV 10. Final thoughts are brought to you by Elder Care Attorney Danny Staggers in downtown Martinsburg. Joe Ferretti, go. Uh, my apologies. I'm afraid I insulted Cro-Magnum humans. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Schultz. <laughs> the low tomorrow morning in Berkeley Springs is going to be 53. I know you all got your own yard work done. Come on over and help me cut firewood. <laughs> yeah. Admiral. Yeah, the West Virginia coach must be uh, uh, having sleepless nights, opening up the season with Penn State. Mike Carl. Cards need to do better against the Mets than the Pirates did if they want to get out of last place. Mr. Height. School buses are about to hit the roads. Watch out for the kiddos. Very nice, Elliot. Hey, it's uh, 10 o'clock. Dave Ramsey shows next.